The opening musical meditation was performed by Tai Shapiro, whom I'll introduce momentarily, but first we have to take care of some business. So this event is being sponsored by the Emotional Brain Institute, with researchers located at NYU Washington Square, NYU Langone Medical School, and the Nathan Klein Institute. And it's also being sponsored by the NYU Max Planck Center for Language, Music, and Emotion, otherwise known as CLAIM, uh, with David Popple and Kate Hartley as co-directors. And the researchers are located here at NYU and also at the Max Planck in Frankfurt. And we also want to thank the Office of the Dean for Science at NYU for support of this event, and especially to uh, Dana Bevelacqua um, for making all the pieces of the puzzle fit together so seamlessly. Thank you, Dana. So let us begin. So we know that music plays an important role in our lives. It's central to what it means to be a human being. And while we often think of it as entertainment, it has other important roles, both socially and personally, that we'll be talking about today. In particular, the role of music in everyday health and well being, and in healing from both psychological and physical illness. So, our guests today are Takani Tomeno and Atai Shapira. After their presentations, we'll have a discussion with our panelists, Kate Hartley, Pablo Ripolet, uh, Claire Pelowi sorry, Pelofi, and um, these are all from CLAIM. Uh, and then the audience members are invited to submit questions in Zoom and the chat function uh, to be taken later. So I've known Atai and Connie for many years, and it's a great pleasure to have them here today with us. Atai is an Israeli-born musician who lives in New York. The New York Times described him as a dynamo on violin. He's an acclaimed soloist and has performed across the globe with the BBC Orchestra, the Belgrade Philharmonic, Cape Town Philharmonic, Chestnut Czech National Symphony, Israeli Sim, uh, Chamber Orchestra, the Royal Philharmonic, the Russian Philharmonic, to name a few. In New York, he's performed at Carnegie Hall, Alice Tully Hall, National Sawdust, and other venues. He has more than 20 CD recordings. Recently, the Victor Herbert Foundation recognized his innovative projects as soloist, composer, and curator with their award. Ty is also the founder and director of Sound Potential, an organization dedicated to medical and societal healing through music. Via Sound Potential, he's collaborated with architect Daniel Liebeskind and novelist Salman Rushdie, as well as with me on some occasions. He's been, today he played his 1745, uh, I'm gonna blow this name as well, um, Guda, Gudanani uh, violin, and 1745 is not a model number, it's the actual date of the violin. So, um, Atai, thank you for joining us. Connie Chimantoeno is the executive director of the Institute for Musical and, Neu and Neurological Function, which she co-founded in 1995 as a result of a long-standing set of collaborations with Oliver Sacks. His book, Musicophilia, is dedicated to her. She has 40 plus years of study in the, in the clinical applications of music and neurological rehabilitation. She's the past president of the American Association for Music Therapy and is a founding uh, member of the board for the International Association for Music and Medicine. Connie recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Music Therapy Association. She has two degrees from NYU and we welcome her back to, to NYU today. Connie, the floor is all yours for now. Great, well, thanks so much, Joe. And it's really a, a pleasure to be to be here with you and to talk about the work. And I know it's just a short a period of time. So I'd like to give some highlights about the things that interest me and the importance of music 
in health, but really as it relates to um, the people that have neurologic impairments and also its implications for growth and, and health. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this will come out very easily. And I'll start from slideshow from beginning. So like Joe said, I've, I've been a music therapist since the late 70s. And my interest in, in music and the brain has really stemmed from my early work with people with Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, we think about music, we think about the complexities of music, especially those of you in neuroscience who um, are trying to understand all those nuances of what makes our experiences with music so profound and whether the you know, elements of music that do that too. Um, my question from the beginning was how does somebody with end stages of dementia who has no, supposedly no cognitive function, no awareness of the world around them, can't process faces, can't process information, and yet can remember a song, recognize the words and even sing the words. What is it about that familiar music that arouses and stimulates preserved function in someone who seems to be so limited? And so over the years, that's been really the focus of the Institute is to, um, is to understand what that is. For people with memory deficits, we know that um, not only the emotional relevance of the song, the, the longstanding uh, historical elements of our life experiences that we attach to music become very well preserved. And we could tap into those um, by finding music that's relevant to an individual, a song that may um, help them not only recall memories, but to actually stimulate and arouse and prime recall of other information. So we don't know the mechanisms by what, how that works. Uh, an interesting study that Peter Janata from UC Davis did actually looked at some of the areas of um, uh, concurrence when a piece of music has elements that are related to person and place and time and emotional uh, meaning. And, you know, this yellow area, he calls it the medial prefrontal cortex, but, you know, an area where all of those, with all of those elements are present in the piece of music, they all converge in processing in that area. And one of the questions is whether somebody with neurocognitive deficits like dementia um, are actually uh, getting enhanced information because the songs that they love stimulate enough areas that allow for this kind of, um, convergence to take place and allowing them to provide uh, a response that makes sense to them in that moment. So some of the important things about music that we know, is one of the challenges in music therapy is understanding um, what are the elements of music that affect function? You know, what are the components that drive different types of, of responses? And then what are the nuances of when the therapist is working with the individual. So that becomes even more complex. But from neuroscience research and from collaborations, we know that pure arousal, just the sound awakening and stimulating a response is, is primary, right? But the other things that are really important are the entrainment of the rhythm and the patterns of sound that can regulate physiological states. So things that we don't even think about that we can change heart rhythms and um, EEG rhythms and things like that, just purely through the pulse of the music, uh, we can affect emotional states and motor activity. And I'll show you an example of that. And then the rhythm patterns of, of sound actually provide a temporal construct and the melodic contour inform speech. So rhythm and melodic contour inform not only um, how we speak, but also how people perceive speech. And in fact, there's been some interesting studies that so, show that young children with language delays actually have poor rhythm perception. And so some of the interesting things that we're looking into working on is whether we can provide rhythm-based activities to help children who have language delays actually understand the patterns of sound. So then they could actually in, hear and, and understand patterns of speech. So this rhythmic processing seems to be a precursor and the requirement for language acquisition. So how does that happen and why does it happen? And how can we use rhythm training to help young children with language delays able to um, really enhance that level of function? In people with um, 
attention deficit disorders or people with um, different types of cognitive processing uh, challenges, music provides that, that framework in which we can hold attention and help things uh, build things like working memory and mental flexibility and self-control. So music therapists many times are working specifically in those areas, both in child development, but also with older adults and also healthy adults to help them become mentally, ment mentally flexible in their thinking and um, improve some of the other aspects of their abilities. Um, one of the most interesting things about rhythm is its ability to entrain and stimulate some of the primary areas of motor function. And we see this really dramatically in people who've had, who have Parkinson's disease or movement coordination issues. And this, this really short example is of a man with Parkinson's who has uh, some irregular movements, but when he's moving to rhythm, he's able to do a very difficult task, which is lifting up his legs, tapping his legs at the same time. He gets a little stuck, but then uh, when I ask him to move forward, he actually does with no problem. Let me see if I can get that. So in that case, you could see how his steps are absolutely in sync with the music. And, you know, all of it actually used to use a, a, a quote uh, that you are the music while the music lasts. And for people with motor problems, using rhythm as a cue to optimize the synchrony of movement is really, really important. And that can carry over at times um, if the person can sing the song to themselves too. So there's this in internal mechanism where they can generate that sense of movement purely by, by singing the song. And like with people with um, Alzheimer's disease and neurocognitive deficits, music can help um, stimulate implicit and procedural memory. It can help with recall and recognition based on life associations uh, too. So many times we'll use that not only to help somebody recall memories, but also sometimes as a mnemonic device to help them store new memories. And there's been some interesting studies where um, I think uh, where phrases are put to a melody and people with Alzheimer's disease actually remember the phrases better when they're paired with melodies. So in the early stages of neurocognitive decline, using music as a way of um, helping the person retain information, sort of the way we remember phone numbers in commercial jingles and things like that. Go there. Okay, so in the context of music therapy, now what's really interesting is that besides the elements I spoke about, which are purely part of music itself and how it affects us physiologically and, and psychologically, there's that when a therapist is manipulating music in real time to engage a client or a participant, um, we're looking at responses and then drawing them into that experience. So there's another dynamic that happens that's there's a give and take. So sort of the way, let's say when, when musicians are playing together too, this is, um, movement that happens in synchrony that happens that, that also informs function. So there's the music and then there's the synchrony between two people. And what I'd like to show you and, and some of my interest in recent days has been in the whole area of music improvisation because many times when we're working with clients, we'll see ability where technically they have gotten stuck in traditional rehab and traditional uh, medical interventions where somebody with a stroke who can't really move, um, if they're playing along with drums, the range of motion will increase. Or if a person um, can't speak, if we're doing some kind of a vocal improvisation, words and other elements of speech will come out. And Charles Lim has done, he's a neuroscientist, he used to be at Johns Hopkins, I think he's out in, in California now. Um, he's done some interesting research showing how um, when somebody is improvising, that there's a, redu a reduction in their self-monitoring. There's also some a disinhibition that takes place. 
and there's increased of range of responses and increased self-expression. And then this, some people may refer to this as flow state. So when people think about jazz and they think about being in the zone when they're creating music, um, it's being so lost in the in the element of, of making the music and that experience that they're not really thinking of the individual things that they're doing at that time. And so that really becomes a helpful thing um, when working with clients who have disabilities or have inhibitions that cognitively they can't plan or execute, but in the context of free music association can do it. So what I'm gonna show you is a, a, a video, now this is a clinical one. So for the recording, you won't be able to keep it, but I'll, I'll, I am able to show and have permission to show it for this. So this is a, a, a music therapist, music therapy intern, working with a client who had a stroke who has limited range of motion on one side, who no longer uh, was no longer receiving occupational therapy or physical therapy because she refused care. She had so much pain in her arm. Um, she had limited range of motion, even to, for the therapist to move it slightly, she would pull away and refuse to be part of therapy. So she was discontinued. We, we use a, a, a an electronic device called a sound beam, which is basically a, a, a MIDI device, MIDI trigger. It, it projects um, a beam, sound beam into space. And then you break the beam, different musical events take place. And so here the stroke survivor is playing the sound beam with her movements and the music therapist is supporting her and encouraging her to go even further. So I'll show just a little snippet of this. So you can see there very clearly, you know, as the notes, the therapist is raising the notes higher and higher to get the woman to even stretch even more and then supporting her musically too. So that really, this is really a brief introduction to, you know, some of the aspects of clinical work and why music plays such an important role and all the ways that we can use it. And then, you know, based on, I realize I have to move these out of the way. Um, based on what we know about music in therapeutic situations, we could take some of the, you know, tried and true things that work really well, and then use technology to augment the delivery of, of those therapeutic interventions so more people could benefit from it. So things like, you know, using rhythm-based music in the, in the treadmill that Biodex is doing and, you know, creating personalized pro, uh, programs, music programs for people with dementia or using accelerometers and, and GPS systems in your iPhone to help you walk better. There's ways that we can then use music to, um, to help optimize function and health. And apps like Spiritune, I'm working with them and have been working for two years on developing some of the soundtracks for their programs. And this is really to optimize everyday um, workflow and, and wellness too. So that's really quick introduction and I'll give my screen back to you, Joe. Thanks, Connie, that was wonderful. Um, we'll come back to you in a few minutes, but uh, let's turn to Atai now for his part and then we'll have a general discussion. Okay. I would like to start really by, by thanking both um, Joe and Connie uh, because just about all the work I do um, as an extension of, uh, as a performer and composer uh, is influenced by conversations with Joe um, and uh, my time at the IMNF um, 
but Connie has kindly let me attend uh, music therapy sessions. And um, a lot of it because I wanted to think about how can I be the most useful as a composer and violinist, uh, being that I'm not a music therapist, being that I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, I, so then I thought it'd be best if I collaborated with them. So I started to develop uh, my own original material to be used as integrated therapy through music. Um, at around the same time, I met a cultural anthropologist, Natasha Zaretsky, who got me interested in um, music for um, group and societal healing. So as more and more colleagues um, had a positive reaction, I formed an organization called Sound Potential. Um, and um, if I could ask uh, Dana to just play our um, just quick uh, trailer video, we provide all kinds of therapies, but this gives um, this very truncated video gives uh, just just an idea of how a melody develops. So this first one uh, is going to be set to the Andalusia prayer and what we're going to focus on here is following a particular theme, a melody from the piece and what I want you to envisage is the nervous system here. So our nervous system consists of the brain, the spinal cord which is held within our vertebral column. It then branches at every level of the spine and goes out into lots of tendrils through the body that serve everything. So what we're going to focus on on the first half of the theme is drawing in towards that spinal column, harnessing the energy there, and then on the second half of the theme sending it out to the periphery. In this case we're going to do that with the arms. So the melody goes like this. Da da da, da 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 da. Very simple. So I suggest you hum for this. I sang it out so that you could hear it. But if you hum, you'll feel that vibration in the body as well. So I'm going to begin just with one arm. So the first half. So we use that first half to draw into the core the second half to send it out to the periphery. Then repeat on the other side. A progression of this would be to do both arms simultaneously, like this. And I want you to be really aware right to your fingernails on the end. If you feel it's challenging in a seated position, you can equally do this lying down on the floor. Hey, it's Patty Hopkins Kimball. And Hank Smith from Raleigh, North Carolina. We're gonna play you a clip from Itai Shapira's Sephardic Journeys and it makes us feel very majestic. We're gonna do it in a bluegrass style. So um, I just wanted to say that um, all our therapies are different. Uh, what they do have in common is that they, uh, they involve a lot of repetition and slight variation. The variation um, has to do with the particular therapy which we develop for practitioners um, and participants. 
So if I could just ask uh, Dana to play the very short file of um, uh, which I called Bukhara. Uh, it's simply a short melody that's a very variation of the first one. Great, thanks. So it's, it's literally the same melody, just in the major key instead of the minor, and twice as fast. Um, then the participant goes back to the original melody. Um, now, if I could ask Dana to play uh, Jerusalem, another variation of the same theme. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just another example, um, it's uh, a short segment later in the movement, which I called Universal, and it's literally the very same melody as the opening, just a much more active texture. Thank you. Um, I wanted to show um, another example of what we do. Um, this is um, a long-term project um, which I'm doing with um, Saman Rushdie, uh, visual artist Alexander Klingspor, and animator Annika Klingspor. Um, in the form that we're going to watch, the, the, the segment we're going to watch, we'll watch about half of what, of what we've done so far, um, is more educational. The idea is uh, for um, students to learn about magical realism, to learn um, historical facts about the Indo-Pakistani uh, conflict, um, the reality of what it could be like for any one of us to wake up one day and become a refugee or a veteran after war um, or an immigrant. So what we're going to see now is the um, artistic uh, and educational version uh, we are developing um, a more specific therapy, and that is uh, PTSD management. Uh, the idea is to um, help people get out of, uh, particularly uh, veterans, get out of brain lock. Um, and that therapy will be quite different, but if for now we could just see uh, a little bit of that video, Dana. One Kashmiri morning in the early spring of 1915, my grandfather would try and recall his childhood springs in paradise. At the precise instant of India's arrival at independence, I tumbled forth into the world. I, Salim Sinai, 
had become heavily embroiled in fate. Silent cousins, monkeys on leashes ceasing their chatter, cobras coiled in baskets, and the circling fortune teller finding history speaking through his lips. Beginning. A son. Such a son. And then it comes. A son, Saiba, who will never be older than his motherland, neither older nor younger. There will be two heads, but you shall see only one. There will be knees and a nose, a nose and knees. Newspapers praise him, two mothers raise him, bicyclists love him, but crowds will shove him, sisters will weep, cobra will creep, washing will hide him, voices will guide him, friends mutilate him, blood will betray him, spittoons will brain him, doctors will drain him, jungle will claim him, wizards reclaim him, soldiers will try him, tyrants will fry him, he will have sons without having sons, he will be old before he is old, and he will die before he is dead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to show a few examples um, and um, looking forward to discussing more uh, later. Okay, thank you, Atai. That was wonderful. Um, so I think what we'll do right now is we'll have a, um, a discussion amongst, um, I will talk to Atai and, and Connie for a few minutes, and then the panel will um, engage them in, in some question and answers as well. And then at the end, we'll turn to the audience for some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat. So, uh, Connie, um, you described the, um, the amazing effects on these patients as motor uh, effects, but obviously the way the motor system is getting activated is through the sensory system. Are there any specific examples of you know, how the music is affecting uh, the patient's sensory systems at all? Besides the, the motor system, obviously there's um, even tactile or proprioceptive type information that's been um, enriched through these activities. So for example, working with somebody who has uh, gait issues and using the rhythm to direct that over time as they practice, their sense of, of moving in space is improved. So there's uh, the possibility of reduction of faults. Or, or using an auditory cue to um, direct their attention to the distance of the steps so they can understand how far their foot has to move to touch the ground. So if they have um, reduced proprioceptive ability in the balls of their feet, they can't feel the floor. They have no sense of where their foot is 
needing to move to successfully hit the ground, um, that sense can be enriched by auditory cues as well. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, the, um, what's the, the duration of these effects? The, uh, I mean, they, obviously they're impressive in the moment, but uh, how long do they last? Right, so um, the cues obviously affect the people immediately in, in the moment. The challenge is to have the person successfully repeat those skills over time and um, continuously in the same manner over time so that the actual action is preserved. So it's not so much for them to make music, it is for them to be able to walk and to coordinate movements or to speak, whatever the goal is that we have. So the repetition of that skill is important because over time, whether it's a compensatory mechanism, another network of the brain is being taught how to take on this function, or it's actually recovery of function in a certain area that's been damaged. Um, we don't know specifically how that happens. There's been you know, tests that show both compensatory mechanisms like in speech or um, enriched me mechanisms in motor function. Um, but that kind of carryover really depends on the rigor at which the intervention is given, how, much, how long, what the duration is, how consistent that cue and that response is um, repeated by the client. And if they have a conscious awareness of what they're doing, so they too can use it successfully when they're home. Because obviously we can't see everybody 24 seven. So we do a lot of training of care partners and people who live with the individual so they can take these skills and actually practice every day with them. So a lot of what you were just describing is um, helping the patient form new habits. Exactly, and, and, help, and helping the brain keep it, yeah. Okay. Um, well, habits, I mean, that's one good thing about habits is the brain likes to, once they get a habit, once the brain gets a habit, it likes to keep it. Um, Sometimes it's hard to break our habits. Um, but I, I'm curious about, for example, in the Parkinson's patients, we know that habit learning like this is dependent upon the striatum and the striatum is a problem in Parkinsonism, right. but they can benefit from it in, in the same way, right? Exactly. And, and for people with Parkinson's and, and one of the beauties of having portable devices now, like, like MP3 players and phones, people have their cueing device at their fingertips at any time. You know, so um, one, of, one of the other interesting things with Parkinson's is in some cases, people may lose their perception of rhythm because there is damage to the basal ganglia and other places where they, um, the actual uh, perception of where the beat in rhythm is. And so um, sometimes we have to augment that too in a certain way so they could benefit from it. Um, before I turn to a tie for a couple of questions, uh, what's your favorite Oliver Sacks story? Oh, well, um, The Last Hippie is one of them. And uh, all my favorite Oliver Sacks stories are the trips that we took together. So I can't even talk publicly about some of those <laughs> wild, wild excursions, but um, someday I'll, I'll get, them, get them out there. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. We'll come back to you in a few minutes. Okay. All right, so, you know, I've known you for a number of years and I, the way we got to know each other is because you came to ask me something about, um, uh, I guess maybe it was dopamine and pleasure or something like that. And I tell you that was you know, nonsense. And we had a, a friendship develop on the basis of that. Um, but what led you to first even get interested in neuroscience? Um, a, a number of, of things, but um, I would say, um, um, my own injury uh, many years ago um, and um, writing music uh, was a result of that and um, I, I basically got rid of headaches and was able to uh, piece back together a lot of memories that were lost and I wanted to know why that was um, and a few years later I had um, a hand injury from which I recovered but while um, I was able to perform concerts, um, it was doctor's orders not to practice. And I couldn't understand why it was very difficult for me uh, not to practice. You know, I, I, I felt like I was really um, not doing as well, even though that injury was not nearly as serious as the first one. So I wanted to know what is it about my routine uh, that might be beneficial. 
So I started to do a lot of reading, uh, but it wasn't until I heard about the Aurora shooting uh, where one of the victims who was a violinist and composer, um, he had a bullet go through her nose. Uh, there was a lot of um, media about how her recovery was miraculous. And I wanted to know what miraculous meant. Uh, could she still uh, perform? Was she in pain? Uh, how was her balance? How was her memory? So I um, developed a series of exercises. Uh, and um, I started speaking to them about it to, with various uh, scientists and giving lectures. And uh, you came to my second one. Uh, in which I, I quoted you quite a bit. And um, I'm very thankful uh, that you advised me uh, not to take things out of context. Um, and we just started talking a lot more and I wanted to see how it could be useful. Um, so um, thankfully, you know, we kept talking. And then from that, I started speaking to more and more people. and. Um, then the idea that basically um, I could be that much more useful, essentially giving material, developing it with experts from various fields as a third party um, was very well received and as it continues to grow. So what um, at, at Sound Potential, what um, you, you told you showed us some things that are beautiful and interesting, but the, um, we didn't really see the therapeutic application. So what exactly is going on at Sound Potential that's um, uh, being applied to, to people with problems? So basically when I um, start composing a piece, um, you know, I could use um, a piece by Mozart or Beethoven. There's certainly plenty of amazing music out there, uh, but ethically I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, changing any of it. Um, so when I compose a piece, I think of certain um, medical and societal issues that are connected, right? because every patient comes with a story, um, as, uh, as Connie was saying. Um, then I literally um, take some of the, the very basic uh, properties of that musical cell, and I develop according to the therapy that is needed. So on a very, very oversimplified level, um, therapy for women recovering from um, from pain uh, will be quite different uh, than um, a COVID first responder, uh, you know, uh, doing breathing exercises uh, to music that I compose for that. Great. Um, so I think what we can do now, I don't think we can just see, I don't think I had uh, anything else that absolutely had to ask you. Um, the, why don't we turn it over to the panel and, um, uh, let them ask a few questions before we have the uh, audience involved. So Pablo, would you, or Kate, would you like to start? I'm happy to start. Um, I think I'll pick up a little bit on what Itai was just um, speaking about in terms of uh, sort of tailoring what the, what the content of the therapy is to um, the sort of nature of the psychological uh, of the nature of the psychopathology. And I, I'm wondering if you can say a little more about what is involved in that process of tailoring it. So you talked about um, chronic pain and pain recovery or PTSD and you know sp specific historical traumas. So what is, to what extent is, um, are there commonalities across patients with similar um, forms of psychopathology? And then what is the goal that you are trying to accomplish with, um, with, the, with the therapy that's, that's tailored to um, the this, this specific um, psychological ailment, um, if you will? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the goal is, is very simple. The goal is to try to help. Um, and uh, it's to... Um, you know, um, as, as we know, healing is not just for the sick. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, we can all improve uh, every day uh, by forming and sustaining and developing good habits, um, obviously. Um, in terms of the commonalities, so the, the uh, when I started to do this, um, and, uh, and when I started to give lectures, part of me was hoping that since I'm dealing with science, I will get really, really clear answers. You know, it wouldn't be great if I figured out this chord and a particular chord would activate 
uh, you know, uh, the amygdala, and then balance it out with the prefrontal cortex. And of course, the brain doesn't work like that. It shouldn't work like that. Um, so um, I was surprised to find out uh, the extent to which um, how many of the therapies uh, do have in common and how quite often I, I had a particular goal with the, uh, a certain practitioner in mind, I would get a different response that would be helpful in a way that's different than what I would anticipate. And at first I was disappointed uh, because it wasn't my, what I had planned, but then I realized it really was helping, so I would go um, with that. Um, in terms of more uh, specifics, I mean, I, I can give um, so I, I should also mention that all the therapies I develop, I first start with their practitioners. The practitioners try it out. So it's not invasive. There's, there's no risk. Um, and then as they start to work with their clients, we tailor it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so much of the process is very patient specific. So if there's, you know, for example, you know, the, the particular symptoms that a patient is presenting with or struggling with, you'll think about what might be helpful exercises to try and um, ameliorate them. Um, uh, that's how it starts. And then quite often I'm asked to develop uh, or we are asked to develop material for groups. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, of course, uh, hard to gauge at first. And also what I've seen at the, at the sessions of the IMNF is that even with the group, uh, with a, uh, the chair particular problem, obviously everybody responds differently. So as composer, I use the um, advantage that I can break down uh, the musical material to different um, aspects. So when I record with the BBC, we recorded the melodies at a slower pace for one, certain melodies. Then we would take, um, you know, not all patients want to sing. So we either have them hum softly or they can do the rhythm. So we provide them just with the rhythmic element of the texture. Others don't want to do rhythm, they'd rather hum, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, uh, as composer, I have to think about these things anyway. So it, it's yeah. not a, a big a stretch as it might um, sound at first. Yeah, so, so you're using your intuitions or your, your understanding about how a listener responds to music to try and think about how to change the state of the, uh, the, you know the state the state of the the group or the individual that you're, that you're um i start with my intuition but um i you know i, I prefer to leave my intuition to myself um yeah. i speak to the practitioners and i ask them what they, what they need um and the therapy that i develop is always integrated into therapy that is already occurring so which is quite different than music therapy it's integrated therapy through music mm -hmm. Tab, uh, could you say some someone from the audience wanted to know what the um, title of your pieces are? Just say a brief word about that before we move on. Um, the very first segment I played was uh, a variation on the very very first piece uh, I've written. Uh, it's called Concerto Latino, and uh, that section is an introduction to a movement I called Party, uh, because it was um, after I had pieced together the memory that I lost. It's for violin and orchestra, but I, I did what I could with the, with the violin. But the other piece was the uh, part of the- Other Sephardic piece, uh, the video is the Sephardic Journeys. Um, and the last one was um, Midnight Children. Thank you. Pablo, Claire, do you have uh, anything? Can, it's okay if I go? Yeah. So um, I want. I have a question for for Conchita. By the way, Conchita is a, a, a real pleasure to to meet you. Yes. Um, knowing your work and, and and your experience, and now watching that video that that you play there. So we've been uh, working uh, in my lab and in my in the former lab, in the lab in which I was a PhD in Barcelona in uh, music supported therapy. And one of the things that I've been thinking lately is that there's this idea that music can provide an enriched environment based on, on animal models that show that when you give the, the rodents things to do, uh, you give them an enriched environment that promotes plasticity and uh, helps them to recover, right? So that even just listening to music can provide an enriched environment. And I'm really interested in 
in internally gener generated signals. Um, I'm wondering how motivation understood as, a, as something that uh, is generated internally, sure, in response to, to, to music, but that at the end of the day is an internally generated signal can be also understood uh, in the context of as, as, as another aspect of, mm. of this enriched environment. And uh, because there is like a couple of years ago, Jennifer Grau Sanchez, who was a PhD student in Antonio Rodríguez Fornes Labs in Barcelona, they published this paper in which they show that in a group of patients with a stroke who were undergoing music supported therapy, the ones who benefited most from the therapy were actually the ones who had a higher sensitivity to musical reward. So the ones who were more sensitive to music were the ones who benefited the most. And that's a, mi that's a weird mixture between uh, something internal and something external. And uh, I would just like, you have so much experience that I would like to, to, to hear your thoughts on that if that's possible. Well, it's interesting, Pablo, because um, one of the challenges in any kind of rehab, even, even in, in child development, so you're talking about people who are developing skills and people who've lost skills, um, motivation is at the core of where the learning takes place. If somebody doesn't participate and actively um, engage in a certain activity, they're not going to learn it and they're not going to retain it, right? So the challenge in using the music is how to um, enhance their engagement time and have them feel successful. And mm. as they feel successful, so a great example is, you know, Gab Gabrielle Giffitz, the congresswoman who um, had suffered the gunshot wound and, and lost her speech. Um, she couldn't speak at all. And she was very depressed and very frustrated, right? When the music therapist got her to sing a couple of words to a song, she was able to sing words, but couldn't speak them freely and fluently. Um, just hearing herself even sing two words together was, a motivating factor to help have her actually dedicate um, and participate more rigorously in rehab because she knew that there was some hope that she could recover. So that's that's part of the, you know the the challenge and the goal to music therapy specifically or any type of therapy where we use it in the healthcare or educational situation is how to show success and how to make that be part of the experience so that the patient and the person actually benefits and, and retains that skill and further develops it. That's wonderful. So do you think that music works that well and music is special because music is special or because music is very flexible in the sense that you can tailor it uh, to the specific needs of the, of the patients in many different ways, right? I was uh, really impressed by, by that technique and that, that video that you show in which uh, the patient was just with the hand. Uh, that was a, like a super beautiful way of, of allowing the person to be engaged, right? So I'm wondering if if you think that music is a special period or is music is special because it's flexible? So it's, it's, it's both. So there's, you know, how we, how we respond to music because obviously, and, and Tay said this too, they, everybody responds to music differently in some regards and sometimes there's some similarities. So there's some, you know, things that all of us, you know, will move to music and whatever. Um, but uh, how it's, um, I'm just losing my train of thought because I got so excited by <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, engaging them in, um, oh, sorry, I just, I really lost my train of thought. So you asked me one more time. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was wondering because this, this is something that we are wondering uh, a lot in the lab, which is if we engage a lot in music, with music, and music is so useful, not only for, for motor recovery, but when like all of us, we use music to upregulate, to unregulate our mood. And we're wondering if it's because music is special or because music is very flexible and can be tailored. It, it, that's what I meant by, by both, because, yeah. because music is so flexible, we can really target specific goals based on nuances within the music. So there's the timing, there's the emotional components. You know, um, whether, depending on the person's culture, they're gonna to respond to different modes of music differently, obviously, right? Hmm. Um, but we could generate, um, you know, chemical changes if somebody has a peak experience with music so we can make them feel better sort of like the just the grand start study that you talked about where people were listening to music after stroke and how 
um, they improved. So there's something inherent in the music itself, but then the flexibility of, of the components of music and the person's lived experience with music allows us to adjust it to meet particular needs of that client. So that's why I think of all the arts therapies, music therapy is one that holds the most promise because it's not just on the psychotherapeutic level, but really on a neuro neurological level mm -hmm. uh, because of the way that rhythm and sound drive physiological and neurologic um, aspects of our function. Thanks, thanks so much. Sure, my pleasure. Sarah, do you have something? I had a question that was very similar to the one Pablo just asked. Um, uh, well, so maybe, I mean, it was just slightly different. I was, I was just wondering kind of the same thing about why music is so powerful for therapeutic purposes. And um, not so much the flexibility, but uh, I was more thinking of the angle of, do you think it, it has to do, and that's a question for both of you, actually. Do you think it has to do with it being a collection of such interesting acoustical properties, even like rhythmic uh, patterns, plus uh, tonality um, uh, elements uh, and things like that? Or is it more uh, connected to, to something that has to do with the, the way it's able to evoke emotions and even more so um, create social bonds and engage people in a common space where they want to interact with each other? It's real clear, it's, it's all of those. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, if, um, if we're working with people who have uh, psychological issues or um, are in isolation or even can't form relationships, doing something creatively, musically in the same moment allows them to do that. There's also the associations with um, lived experience with music uh, between people that is embodied in the music itself based on the person's experience. But the other piece, um, like I mentioned with Pablo, is uh, these other elements of tr music that drive function. So it's there's so many different ways of applying music and using it to benefit. And you could break it down to core elements of sound, vibration, even frequency, something like a 40 Hertz oscillation can, can hold attention for a, a longer period of time. How does that fit into the intervention that we're creating or that music experience we're creating with the client to optimize what the goal is that they need to achieve, whether it's a psychotherapeutic goal, emotional regulation goal, uh, moving through depression or trauma, all of those are going to demand that music is used a little bit differently, depending on what their needs are. And that's what makes an exciting field to be in. And, and why working with neuroscientists is so important, because we need to really understand those dynamics to really yeah. advance the field. That's quite obvious when we see the, the way uh, interventions are so efficient and so powerful. That's uh, really uh, both moving and very impressive. Um, my, okay, I was wondering also, uh, and this is a, a kind of uh, going back to what you're saying about um, how you tailor each intervention to each person, but at the same time, it seems to me that there is something very um, a core uh, in the uh, sort of cementing interpretation that one can have of the music. Uh, and when you see the people react with their movements, you really feel like th there are actually very few movements that could uh, go along with this particular type of music. And there is this idea in the field that music does possess syntax and a syntactic system. Um, but the idea of, uh, of music semantics, it's much more debated and it's actually uh, ongoing um, you know, current investigations. Um, and I was wondering to which extent you, you, would, uh, you would go with this idea, you would endorse this idea that music does possess a, sort, some sort of a, you know, primitive semantical, semantic systems that also is part of why it, it's so powerful and therapeutic and maybe addressing everyone in, although in slightly different ways. I, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've heard some of those, those discussions. Um, the patterns of sound 
you know, there's been some interesting studies that when uh, people are improvising together, they're actually stimulating language areas of the brain. So even, even creation of patterns of sound are inherently a communication and our brains process it in similar areas. So it's like, it's like the chicken and the egg, what came first. So obviously the patterns of sound and patterns of changes of sound allow somebody to exchange with another person and how those patterns imbue meaning between those two people then gets interpreted in that moment by those people. You know, so it's, it's a real challenging discussion, um, but it's one that's really interesting because at, the, at its essence, it is a, a form of communication that allows us to connect with another person, whether it's pure sound, even if it's rhythm. We, we did a study way back when with people with end stages of dementia who couldn't speak anymore, but they could entrain rhythmically together around a drum table. And so they would all, even though they were erratically banging on the drum, eventually they came into a synchronized rhythmic pattern. And in doing so, they looked at each other as if in that synchrony, there was a recognition that they were doing it together on a really basic level. And so that's like the foundation of all of this is these inherent rhythmic uh, connections. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, this is a this is an idea that really seduces me as well, and uh, and I think uh, music therapy is also um, giving some elements of thoughts around around this. Um, and finally, uh, I want to turn to Itai, and I have a questions about uh, specifically the the variations work that he's done on this uh, on this particular melody. Um, not, I'm not sure I could hum it uh, anymore, but I was very very beautiful, very profound. Um, I was wondering if you, what's, well, I have an idea of what would be the um, therapeutic um, effects of having someone listen to variations of the same melody and some, you know, have a team and, and developed it in, uh, in, in different forms. Uh, to me, it's a way to engage with a core principle of uh, or a co cognitive process of analogies of making analogies between different objects that resembles each other yet are different is it what you have in mind when you when you work on those variations or is there something else that i'm uh, that i'm missing um to, to an extent um the these little variations um are literally a development within the piece and um i think that listening uh is essentially, well, thinking is, is the first phase of learning, but, but listening is, is very, very important, obviously. Um, but listening is only um, a small part of the therapies uh, that, that I developed. There's a lot of activities. So the idea is that, and in a way that one of the most important things is that um, the, the users uh, memorize uh, mm -hmm. the melody. So, so they constantly, um, comparing the slight variations. The variations are much more gradual than the ones I shared. Um, and I also, I also literally write notes of activities um, that are, that's a dynamic process with the practitioners. Um, so I was, uh, I was very surprised, uh, for example, uh, we started to do a study at Mount Sinai uh, with um, a colleague who uh, I went to Juilliard with his violinist, and now he's an anesthesiologist. And I thought I didn't have enough material. So I developed a whole bunch of melodies because the sessions are 45 minutes long. And I was very surprised that the users, they wanted to repeat the same one over and over and over again for 45 minutes. So it really just uh, changes uh, every time and, and I get feedback and then I uh, retailer it. That's interesting. I see the, the same patterns of behavior in my in my two year old. Mm. <laughs> um, a time maybe this would be a good time for you to pay, to play your uh, last piece, and then we'll turn to the question and answers um, from the the floor um, during the remaining time we have. Great. So um, I usually um, these days uh, perform my own material, but um, this time I'm going to perform um, a friend of a piece by a friend. Uh, named Dave Heath. This piece was written for me, and it's a combination of uh, Celtic 
and Jimi Hendrix. He loves Jimi Hendrix. And the reason for why I chose this is because um, the first uh, therapy session I participated in, in um, at a certain point, the music therapist asked me to play something rhythmic for the patient. So I started uh, just playing a few bars. And from uh, the patient having her arm, she, her, basically she was holding a fist to her knee. She, she couldn't move, she was screaming. Um, after 20 minutes of screaming subsided and after rhythmic exercises, uh, she could say a few words. And by the end, um, she was um, having a conversation, which was, this was an incredible thing for me to see. So this is the piece that I played. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Atara. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, one thing Zoom is appear, apparently is very good for now is, is to see your hands and your face while playing the violin. It's a, <laughs> a great shot. <laughs> so thank you. All right, we're going to take some questions from the, uh, from the floor. Um, I want to start with uh, Amanda Tharp, and I'm picking her because Amanda is the ex-bass player of the amygdaloid, so she gets special preference, even though she lives in England now. So Amanda says, um, is there a specific dosage requirement for new learning to stick? Um, and I think, oh, I missed the first part. So let me go back up here. In the UK, music is not considered primary therapy, a primary therapy. However, it seems that music therapy can be very beneficial in neuro rehabilitation. Uh, is music therapy in the US considered a, a, and funded as a primary therapy? And are there key indications as to which clients will benefit most from music therapy? Connie, would you like to? Yeah, let, me, let me answer that. You know, it's interesting because in the, in the UK and the, the EU right now, um, the World Health Organization has actually started uh, arts prescriptions. So that's becoming part of their universal health care is to prescribe arts-based programs for um, all types of health, mental health, and physical health, but in the United States, it really depends on where the service is being provided. So for example, in, in pediatric uh, hospitals, um, music therapists are usually employed full time as part of the staff. In, in rehab hospitals, but they have to be acute rehab hospitals, uh, music therapists are part of the staff. Um, depending on what state you live in, uh, there may be reimbursement through insurance for the type of neurologic music therapy, these types of clinical applications. Um, in mental health, music therapists who are trained at the master's level um, and in New York State are licensed can get reimbursed to provide music psychotherapy. And that's a reimbursable service. So it really depends on the state. It depends on the Medicare, Medicaid uh, law in that state. Um, we're trying to, we're seeking national attention. I think one of the nice things that's happening because of all this information that's coming from um, both NIH funding for music and health, as well as the science that supports some of these clinical outcomes, they, doctors and neurologists are actually referring people to music therapy because they see the benefits, especially in some of these complex cases where cognition may be damaged, where the person can't understand the nuances of physical therapy or speech therapy. Uh, music therapy can really be um, not only a, a supplement to those therapies, but actually primary to get the person to get those responses first, similar to that woman who wasn't able to participate in traditional rehab therapy. Get them motivated, get them able to sh uh, see that they can, themselves can do those responses, and then to um, get them into regular therapy. So it's really a mix. Uh, but we are seeing trends where it's getting more reimbursed and recognized. So uh, here's a question from an anonymous attendee. She's, he or she says, I'm aware that music therapists are trained to use a variety of assessment tools in their practice, especially as a baseline in order to develop clinical goals and objectives. And this person would like to know what, uh, how are you evaluating uh, the outcomes and effectiveness in your practice? Well, in, in my practice, it's, it's all assessment based and, um, and it depends again on the goals and how we're using music. Um, I don't know if that question was directed to Ite because that seems to be a more um, intuitive, intuitive approach based on feedback from the practitioners working with the clients. So in music therapy, we, we are using um, traditional measures. So if it's speech therapy, the speech therapist is doing the evaluation. We can know if the words and fluency is being improved. If we're working in, in rehab therapy, the um, gait, uh, stride length, all of those things are being measured by the physical therapist. If it's a psychotherapeutic intervention, then obviously there's things that we can measure as far as tolerance and emotional regulation and things like that. So uh, we use traditional uh, applications and there's some new 
music therapy evaluation tools that are being developed for special populations as well. And Natalia, how about in your case? So we're literally now um, starting a, a clinical study at Mount Sinai. This is for pain management. Um, so this is going to, um, we were planning on starting it before the pandemic. Um, and then it got delayed. Um, and I was happy to get a message a couple of weeks ago that they're starting it again now. Um, but for the most part, being that I provide material for other therapies, that is, that is, of course, I would like to know that it's helpful and how in order to improve it, but that's secondary. Um, I suppose that the only indicator I have for now that we have for now is that literally every single organization we work with has asked for more material. Thank you. So um, here's another anonymous question. What instruments and our song activity choices would you suggest to encourage language repetition and use with a non-speaking autistic four-year-old, especially with in-person sessions while only music therapists wear masks? Right, so I, I saw that question. I think one of the suggestions I would give, especially because the child can't pick up cues from the uh, facial expression of enunciating words and things like that, um, we know that rhythm and rhythmic cueing works really well in in helping a child uh, understand patterns of speech. So something like a gato drum, a slit drum that has two tones, where each tone changes um, the inflection of the word. So it's, if it's hell low, it would be a rising tone. So bum, 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 bum. And the therapist saying or singing those tones and the sound of the word while having the child tap to it too. So, this kind of repetition would actually allow the child to pick up the nuances of that sound and, and the word structure. So David Popple, who's the director, co-director of McLean, uh, has a question to all of you. Uh, does music or all musics have therapeutic potential? There's so many different culturally contingent forms of music that one wonders whether music is a one size fits all solution that seems too bold? Uh, are there features that are necessary and sufficient? Yeah, um, it's definitely not one size fits all. I mean, there's some things, you know, we talked about like rhythm, um, but people's associations with music, um, cultural associations, the different modes in each culture, they um, indicate different types of meaning. So in Eastern cultures where certain modes um, may represent happiness or love, um, they might not even be interpretative in Western cultures. So those kinds of nuances have to be called to mind too. A question from Anna. Paul Nordoff explored how different musical intervals and modes create different therapeutic responses that may be shared amongst individuals. Have either of you experienced that in your work? I have, I was, I was going to see if Ty wants to answer that. Paul, Paul Nordoff used really interesting chord changes and stuff to um, draw the, the children in, in their expressiveness, but also to hold their attention and um, make them interested and, and responsive. So we change, we, we change um, both the complexity of sound, depending on the person's ability. So sometimes it could be just a simple tone if we're working in speech where we want the person's, uh, the inflection of the tone to be absolute. But if we're trying to create a mood and um, trying to give a sense of uh, meaning, then the chord itself may have importance. You know, does it feel like a, a, a scary sound or does it feel like a uncertain resolution? And does that imply something to that individual? Again, we explore that to see what the responses are. I mean, I, uh, when I compose pieces, I often start with um, elements that are important to a particular culture. So for example, when um, I, I composed a piece um, that's inspired by a Korean, uh, an, a very well-known Korean love tale. Um, and for that, I chose a pentatonic mode, uh, knowing that that is what a lot of um, people in Korea respond to. However, the pentatonic mode is very common in Celtic culture. Uh, in the blues. So uh, one other uh, element which I feel is very important to um, therapy through music is the timbre. So the timbre is, is, is not just the interval, but it's the, um, 
It's essentially the consequence of the overtone, which is a result of the material that is used. So that's why different drums, uh, different stringed instruments, um, a man and a woman could actually use the same pitch, but the sound would be different because of the timbre. And that is something that is very important culturally, um, how people respond. So uh, do, does Korean music go on a 12, 12 scale system? Uh, traditional folk Korean music um, is pentatonic. So it's five, it's five notes per scale. Uh -huh. uh, there are two main modes to it. Um, I, uh, in, in all my pieces, I integrate um, key elements of the culture with my own. So it's basically, uh, I, I feel that no, no problem can be solved if it's isolated to the people suffering from it, because we need, um, yes, we need intervention, we need a building, but we also need a support system. So there are five notes in, in the pentatonic scale or is the same as ours in our scales? Um, the most uh, traditional Western music is actually seven. Uh, it's usually seven notes, sometimes 12. So it's a little different, but a lot of country music, a lot of folk music in the United States is also used in a pentatonic mode. Can I jump in here and ask you a, a question? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that, what you were, you were saying about composing for music therapy. And I want to ask you the question, do you think a composer and a composer for music therapy are essentially doing exactly the same thing? Or is it something special that um, music therapy composition entails in the way you, you work with the sound material? I think it's both uh, because any good uh, piece of music, just like any good story, um, essentially has its own DNA, right? Basically, so think about a, even a book that you like. The, the, the main theme of the conversation reoccurs and develops over time. And if you can't remember it, you won't want to read it or you won't retain it, for one. Um, so I think that any good composition would have that, hopefully. Um, that said, I do develop it in very specific sections um, from the beginning, thinking of certain rhythmic exercises and different timbres. And I, or when I compose it, I also think about, um, since I write mainly for soloists and orchestra, I think about how the instruments from the orchestra can be divided for different uh, sessions. So that, um, I don't know how many other composers uh, do that. That's a good question. Okay, we're gonna take one last question from Sweden. Eric Scarfone has a question. Um, he says, I wonder if you could discuss a bit the mechanistic aspects of the effects of music by linking it to sound that humans perceive have perceived during evolution and development. Uh, as I remember, I believe sound localization is one of the fastest, highest frequency systems in the brain. On the other end of the spectrum, vestibular receptors, i.e. the scarpulous, are able to, uh, to perceive 50 hertz sounds. Uh, Connie, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know the specifics of that. I know that um, things like balance and vestibular function can be driven by uh, auditory beat, uh, different from the higher frequency resonances. So we actually use them separately in the cases of some movement disorders where it's really the beat that's driving vestibular and function and balance. But I don't know the specifics of what he's, he's asking. Okay, well, I think we've, uh, we've had a rich afternoon and we're gonna draw it to a close now. I wanna thank Connie and Atai and uh, Dana and everyone else involved in, in the whole program. Um, and we would uh, we hope to do more of these in the fall. So thanks for everyone for participating and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.